Being a skeptic has always seemed like the most obvious possible position to me. That is until recently. The basic principle of skepticism is that you should, uh, by default, um, doubt. You should not accept any proposition as true unless given sufficient evidence and reason to believe that it is true. I mean, how could anyone oppose such a position? It seems like to do anything else is to believe on blind faith and to completely divorce yourself from all reason. However, I have not divorced myself from all reason, and yet I am no longer a skeptic. Let me explain why. It probably makes sense to start by elaborating on why I was a skeptic in the first place. Uh, basically, I've been wrong about things in the past. Uh, that is to say, I used to believe things which later turned out to be false. And this establishes that my beliefs can be false. And so, how can I be sure that the beliefs I hold right now aren't false as well? I do not want to hold false beliefs, therefore I shall jettison all current beliefs and adopt new beliefs if and only if I can find strong reason and evidence to support them. The other reason that skepticism seems so obvious to me is that skepticism appears to be the only alternative to blind faith, as I mentioned before. After all, a belief not backed by reason and evidence, what else could you call it than faith? With those justifications in place, skepticism probably seems pretty rock solid. It's about time in that case that we get to work destabilizing it. First, let's notice that there is a tension between skepticism and morality. This is perhaps not a decisive problem for skepticism. If morality and skepticism disagree, then perhaps it's morality that we should jettison rather than skepticism. You might have noticed that there is a problem with that statement, but I'll come back to that. The tension between morality and skepticism is this. If you doubt all propositions until you have sufficient reason and evidence to support them, then by the definition of the word all, you must apply that to moral propositions. For example, perhaps you want to kill a man, and I tell you that you should not do so. As a good skeptic, you ask, well, why not? I respond, because killing is wrong. You again respond, why? And at this point, I might say that killing is wrong is just a brute fact, uh, a starting point for moral thought, not a conclusion to be reached. However, as a skeptic, this would make it a belief that is not backed by reason or evidence, and therefore you should not believe it. However, maybe I do have an answer to why is killing wrong. Maybe something like, because it causes people to die. <laughs> As a good skeptic, you carry on. Well, what's wrong with that? Me. Because people are unable to fulfill their values if they're not alive. I'm particularly big-brained. And then you respond, well, why shouldn't I prevent people from fulfilling their values? To which I say because it's wrong, and I think you see where this is going. I cannot have infinitely many steps of logic in my head at any given time, and so we will eventually need to come to a stopping point. When we come to that stopping point, then that stopping point is a belief not justified by reason or evidence. Because the rest of the beliefs in that chain are supposed to justify the next, this means that none of our beliefs are justified, and so as a skeptic, you should not hold any of those moral beliefs. This argument is supposed to show that skepticism and morality are incompatible. However, as I mentioned earlier, perhaps this doesn't mean we should throw out skepticism, but that we should throw out morality. After all, the skeptic believes that skepticism is more fundamental than morality, so if an incompatibility between skepticism and morality is found, all the worse for morality. To him, this might be a reason that skepticism is unappealing, but it's not a reason that skepticism is wrong. That's why I don't expect this argument to convince an avowed skeptic. And so, let's move on to the broader problem here. If I'm going to be skeptical, all of my beliefs, then surely that ends up meaning that I'm not going to believe anything. This is because of the infinite regress problem, as we applied it to morality, but it kind of applies to everything. For example, why do I believe that I'm sitting on a chair right now? Well, 
I mean, I can see it when I look down, I can feel it beneath me, I can hear it if I tap on it and so on. Essentially, I deduce that I am sitting on a chair by reference to my sense data. But as Descartes and Morpheus and every teenager who's thought about philosophy for a few seconds would ask you, why do you believe that your sense data is even correct? Well, perhaps I believe that my sense data is correct because it has proven to be correct in the past, but how did I establish that my sense data was correct in the past? Well, I compared it to more sense data. I look down and see the chair, and then I tap it and hear a plausibly chairish sound, and so I say that the latter sense data confirms the former. But how do I know that both senses aren't wrong? <laughs> This is how you wind up with René Descartes telling you that you can't really know anything about the outside world with 100% certainty. But even René Descartes doesn't take this scepticism 100% seriously. He says that there are certain things we can know with certainty, and those are the things which are logically necessary. The famous example being, I think, therefore I am. The argument that um, in order for us to consider whether we must exist, we must first exist to do the considering, and therefore whatever you are unsure of about the outside world, you can be sure that you exist in some form. But even this is wrong, if we are to really take philosophical skepticism seriously. It's not only our sense data that we sometimes get wrong, it's logic itself. It might not seem very plausible that we really made a logical error in the reasoning when we are going through the argument 1, in order to think I must exist, 2, I am currently thinking this argument, and therefore 3, I exist. However, what if the argument required a million steps of logic? Would you then be so sure that you hadn't made one mistake somewhere along the way which screws it up? How about a thousand steps in logic? or just a hundred. It seems like the fewer steps of reasoning, the lower the chances that we're making a mistake, but it's never something that you can really rule out if you're going to be a true philosophical skeptic. So while it seems to logically follow to me that uh, you must first exist in order to consider whether you exist, perhaps there is some way that I could think without existing that I haven't thought of yet. Or perhaps those premises don't actually lead to the conclusion for some reason that we haven't noticed or even considered. <laughs> this seems ridiculous, to be sure. However, the skeptic's position is not do not adopt a belief unless doubting it seems ridiculous. It's do not adopt a belief unless you have strong reason and evidence to support it. And since, once again, all of our beliefs must be built upon some other belief, which either must terminate somewhere, or go on forever, or become circular, which is itself a fallacy. Therefore, we can't really conclude anything. And this brings us to the justifications for skepticism itself. One of our justifications relied on the observation that we have been wrong in the past, and so to avoid the negative outcome of being wrong, we should only adopt those beliefs which are logically and empirically supported. However, we don't really know whether we've been wrong in the past. We don't know whether the logic I just outlined really even follows, even if we have been wrong in the past. We don't really know anything, including the things that would justify skepticism. Additionally, I think it's time that we returned to the contradiction that we skipped over earlier. Remember the statement, if morality and skepticism disagree, then perhaps it is morality we should jettison rather than skepticism. This is a should claim. We should jettison morality rather than skepticism. That's a moral claim. Or if you think not all should claims count as moral claims, it's at least vulnerable to the same problems with skepticism that we established earlier with respect to morality. The conclusion is that if you're really going to hold philosophical skepticism as your position, then you can't actually justify philosophical skepticism. It's self-defeating. Most skeptics will at this point tell you that, well, of course you need some basic axioms to get going, but this is just a tacit admission that skepticism is untenable. You are adopting beliefs just because they seem really obvious to you. 
or as a skeptic would say, they seem really fundamental, but that amounts to the same thing. Now all that being said, even if we accept that skepticism can't be the correct starting position, what alternative could there possibly be? Just believes things that seem right? Yes. Let's go back to looking down at the chair. I say that I see that there's a chair there, but it would be more accurate to say that it seems to me that I am seeing a chair, and that I am trusting that seeming or intuition. We can also consider the propositions that seem true by matter of logical necessity. It seems to us to be true that we must exist in order to consider whether we exist. A thoroughly skeptical approach would tell us that just because something seems logically necessary doesn't mean that it actually is logically necessary. Uh, we may have just made a logical mistake, of course, but nonetheless, I imagine that most of us would trust that seeming or that intuition, at least by default. Given that everything you could possibly believe seems to stem from a starting point of, well, it seems that way to me, why not just be honest about it? Perhaps, instead of starting from all propositions should be doubted until proven otherwise, we start from the position, things are the way they seem unless you have good reason to believe otherwise. If you take this as your starting position, then your position is what's known as phenomenal conservatism. It's a position advocated for by a philosopher by the name of Michael Humer, and after reading a fair bit of his work and listening to some of his podcasts on which he has appeared, I have been convinced to adopt this position. That isn't to say that I agree with all of his reasoning on even this one topic. Please do not just read Michael Humer's philosophy and assume that you're getting my position. I don't agree with him on everything. He's not David Friedman after all. But many of the views and even a lot of the arguments that he has for this position is very compelling. And so I am now a phenomenal conservative. I believe that if something seems to be the case, then it is unless I'm given sufficient reason to doubt it. And what sort of reason would count? Further and stronger intuitions, of course. This is different from skepticism, by the way, in that we're not starting from zero. We are starting from whatever seems to be the case, and we're testing these intuitions against one another in order to ensure consistency. Why ensure consistency? Well, because it seems extremely obvious, at least to me, that reality must be consistent. A must equal A, and it must not equal not A. Well, when you encounter a powerful new argument, which shows a contradiction between two or more of your beliefs, you will get a very strong intuition that at least one of these beliefs must be false. And so you should stop believing the less obvious one. For example, take a look at this delicious bowl of berries. Or this bowl of delicious berries, the bowl itself is probably not that delicious. After looking at that picture, I get the distinct impression that I've seen a bowl of berries. And so, as a phenomenal conservative, a bowl of berries is what I believe I have seen. Wait, is somebody, is somebody taking a knife to it now? What the heck? He's, he's slicing it into the bowl like it's nothing. Wait, that bowl doesn't look like a bowl? Now that I see the berries in cross section, they don't even look like berries either. I now believe that I am seeing a cake. What a conundrum for this phenomenal conservative. First, it seemed as though I was looking at a bowl of berries, and so I should believe that. Then, it seemed as though I was looking at cake, and so I should also believe that. However, it also seems to me that unless the items were swapped out, which it really didn't seem like they were, that these two positions are contradictory. And it seems more obvious than just about anything I can think of that two contradictory things just can't be. Dramatics aside, <laughs> this is of course not a problem for phenomenal conservatism. I just discard the less obvious intuition for the more obvious ones. When I consider the possibility that it was in fact a cake all along, simply one that was made to look like a bowl of berries, the first intuition, the intuition that I was seeing a bowl of berries, its obviousness plummets, because there's a perfectly plausible alternative story. 
one which doesn't violate the law of non-contradiction. And that's good, because the law of non-contradiction is the most obvious. I think that something like this process is probably happening in everyone's heads anyway, whenever they are doing any reasoning, whether you're a phenomenal conservative or not, that is. However, if we understand what it is we're really doing when we think, I think this will help us to think better. One of the results of phenomenal conservatism is that moral beliefs can be defended just as easily as other beliefs. Ought is just as defensible as is. I see you stab a guy. It seems really, really obvious to me that this was wrong of you to do. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong, I guess. I might later find out that you were performing emergency surgery on the man. I might find out that my initial intuition clashes with my later one, and I might find that the most plausible seeming story is the latter. Alternatively, I might be given a moral argument of some kind which gives me the intuition that my initial killing is wrong stance was mistaken. I'm sure you can think of plenty other bits of reasoning or evidence which might trigger the intuition in me that I was mistaken in my initial moral assessment. However, until I see additional evidence or argument, I will, as a phenomenal conservative, stick with my initial impression. That you stabbed a guy, and you are therefore very bad. Phenomenal conservatism gives you an actual starting point. It gives you the only conceivable starting point, really. Uh, skepticism is a non-starter. Phenomenal conservatism is the way to go. And that is why I left the skeptic community and became a conservative. Now, now with a title like that, you might have thought that this was going to be a video dunking on some extremely vaguely defined group of YouTube ranters and pledging my fealty to some almost as vaguely defined mainstream political movement. But it isn't. I tricked you, and now you've watched an entire video about epistemology like a fucking nerd! Oh.